What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. A few days ago, I asked everyone which characters they liked the most, and then did a poll using some of those characters. A lot of people voted on the humans, at least specifically Tenshinhan, Krillin, and Yamcha. So today we're doing a scenario covering them. The one I'm doing is also a pretty popular suggestion. Obviously after what happened with Android 17 and 18, it shows that humans becoming androids can make them really powerful, and with someone like Bulma on their side, what would have happened if Bulma turned these three into androids just like Jiro did? For this video, we'll be setting a like goal of 4,000 likes. If we hit that, I'll continue with another part and make this into a full series. Anyways, let's begin here. Following the events of the Cell Saga, everyone has a lot to think about. Besides witnessing the awesome power of Gohan and Cell, a lot of people realize that they might be falling behind, specifically the three human fighters. And especially since Goku's not around anymore, they realize they kind of need to pick up the pace somehow. But how can they make themselves stronger? Unlike Saiyans, it's a lot harder for them to break their limits. Saiyans get stronger when closer to death, and they have transformations. It's a pretty unfair advantage if you ask them. Could they ever hope to live up to the power of Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta? Even Piccolo at least has his own ways of getting ahead. And what do the humans have? They could learn techniques such as Kaioken and other things from King Kai, but that's really it. They only have techniques to rely on, no transformations and no special tricks. Then Shinon especially starts thinking about this. Out of the three of them, he definitely would seem like the most motivated to fight. He did keep training after all and he keeps racking his brain trying to think about what he could do. He considers going to King Kai. The training there before was pretty helpful, and if he goes back again, maybe he can learn Kaioken like what Goku has. But would that really work for him? I mean, it would give him a nice boost in power, although the boost wouldn't be too substantial, and it would be kinda hard for him to maintain. He keeps that in mind though, but there's gotta be another way to make himself stronger, right? And then it hits him. He flies over to Capsule Corp with the idea in mind. It's a pretty weird question, and it's a lot to ask for for Bulma, but he goes ahead and asks it. Does she still have the blueprints for the androids and all that research that Jero had? Well yeah, of course she saved everything, that was pretty valuable to have. And he just flat out tells her. He wants to become an android too, he wants her to modify him in order to be like those cyborgs that they fought before. Bulma's confused, does he really want to do that? And Ten says he does. This would be a great way to help him get stronger, and without Goku here, they need as many strong people to protect Earth as possible in case something bad happens again. This could be very beneficial for everyone, plus Bulma will get some research along the way, He's literally offering himself as a human subject for a project for her. And the best part is, it's not like there's any ethical concerns. Unlike the other androids, Ten is willingly agreeing to do this. It's only up to Bulma whether she wants to or not. She says it could be dangerous, but Ten's not worried. If Jero was able to do it in a dingy lab, she could definitely do it with all the great resources she has. She could build upon his knowledge, use better technology. She can make him more efficient. Well, since he's so enthusiastic about it, she agrees to it. But she hopes he knows the risk. He agrees and goes along with it. It takes a bit of time. She ends up doing some research looking through Jero's work. Making an infinite energy engine isn't actually too hard. She already has the blueprints from Jero, and she has the technology to shrink things. She could possibly build a more powerful engine, if anything, and shrink it down enough so it's compact enough to fit inside a Tenshinhan. Besides that, there's a bunch of other things that goes along with becoming an android. And it's a pretty long process, but with the great resources and research she has, and even help from her father, it's a lot less arduous than what Jero had to do. It's done one bit at a time. First his arms are modified, then his legs then his head and finally his body, where the infinite energy engine is installed. All the modifications are in him. Ten stands up, and it's a weird feeling. He feels energy flowing through him, but it's not the key that he normally feels. Not only that, but he feels stronger. His body's more durable. And at first, he almost can't even control his power. He was already strong to begin with. So imagine taking an already strong person and modifying them. With 17 and 18, they were probably just normal people beforehand. Ten's an expert martial artist, who also had great strength and key control to go along with it. He immediately notices how high his power is. Even when he tries to leave the room, he opens a door and accidentally rips it off the hinges, as well as most of the wall with it. He apologizes profusely, but Bulma's actually impressed. These fighters are all great at key control after all. And if even he can't control power like that, it just shows how strong he is. He tells Krillin and Yamcha about this too. Yamcha's a little bit nervous about it. Being modified to be an android? That would be weird. And couldn't things go wrong? But Ten shows off his power. He begins training with them. And not only is he incredibly stronger than them right now, but he doesn't get worn out at all. They go at it for about an hour or so. Krillin and Yamcha are starting to feel a bit worn out, but Ten doesn't feel anything. This is amazing. Obviously he knew about the infinite energy, but he didn't know it would be this exhilarating. It's also a bit weird for Krillin too. He is dating Android 18 right now after all, and he doesn't know what she would think about this. Wouldn't it be kind of offensive to her? I mean, given her history of how she was modified and all. All the terrible things she and Seventeen went through. He even talks to her about it, and she's actually pretty apathetic about it. It's not like he's teaming up with Jiro or anything. She wouldn't be offended and if it makes him stronger than whatever. And as for Yamcha, it's more of an issue of him trying to boost his confidence for it. He tries to hide it, but he is a little bit terrified about becoming an android. Although when it actually happens, he's thrilled. Krillin and Yamcha are then modified afterwards. 
and they feel the same way as Ten. It's amazing. Of course, the other fighters catch wind of this. Obviously, Vegeta would find out first since he's close to Bulma, and then eventually Piccolo and Gohan hear about it too. Vegeta just laughs at it. They need to be genetically modified to get ahead of him. That just goes to show the power of Saiyans. Gohan thinks it's pretty awesome, and Piccolo thinks it's kind of weird. But hey, if it makes for stronger fighters, then so be it. And obviously with these modifications, everyone's going to be way more motivated to train. This mostly applies to Krillin and Yamcha. Ten never had that problem, but Krillin and Yamcha could definitely use that motivation during this time period. They don't want all those modifications and the android powers to go to waste after all. Krillin's already got a great training partner at home who's also an android, and as for Ten and Yamcha, they could just train together. They could even spar with Gohan and Piccolo occasionally, keeping up with their training too. Now I know you all have one big question on your minds right now. You're leaving out the most important character, Chaozu. Chaozu would simply be way too overpowered if they gave him android powers. You don't want a menace like that running around now, do you? Nah, obviously he could use it the most. He gets the modifications too, just for fun basically. Ten's glad that he thought of this. It's amazing that it's the best thing they could do with their human biology. The Saiyans have their transformations, the Namekians have their fusions and regenerations, and as for the humans, they have this now. Although they could possibly even go way beyond that. What if they visit King Kai and get some advice from him? Well, he is dead now because of Goku. It's kind of hard to contact him without Kami now, but hey, you know what? This is good enough as is. They'll keep that in the back of their mind though. Seven years pass. Gohan and Piccolo get a little bit more training, but not too much, although this does help Gohan keep up with his power. So there is a little bit of an advantage there at least, but he's not going to be too incredibly stronger. The main focus is obviously the four humans. Seven years of training with these upgraded bodies and infinite energy is huge for them. Hell, even 18 would benefit from this too since she'd be training with Krillin. And soon enough, they'll have the perfect opportunity to test this power. Another world tournament is beginning soon, and Goku's even coming back for it. And this time there's three new contenders, then Shinhan, Yamcha, and Chaozu all enter. And obviously Krillin's still in it. They're all hyped up. Of course, the other opponents won't be too much trouble for them, but mainly, they're ready to fight each other and their friends. That's going to be the real challenge. Goku's brought back to Earth temporarily, and everyone's glad to see him again. It's actually pretty surprising for him to see this. His best friend is an android now, as well as the other humans too. He even jokes with Krillin. Does that mean his baby's a robot since it's two androids that had her? He just gives Goku a blank stare. That's, that's not how it works, Goku. But more importantly, Goku asks about his power. If they're not able to fight together in a tournament somehow, Goku wants to at least try and fight Krillin later on. But what does Vegeta think of all this? At first, he scoffed at the idea of them becoming androids, but of course, deep down, he realized that this would make them a lot stronger. And he's not jealous, but he's kind of weirded out about the fact that they use this to become stronger. He's been putting in hard work, and ever since they became androids, he's been training even harder than normal. He doesn't need a crutch like them. He's become a lot stronger as well, even unlocking Super Saiyan 2, beyond just his base getting stronger. So, the tournament itself begins, and at first, there's only one real major change. The first match is between Krillin and Shinhan. So even though the tournament is going to get crashed soon, there's still at least one good match going on. And this fight was planned too. They asked Chaozu to switch the numbers around so they could fight first, just in case they wouldn't get the chance to fight later on. And this is a perfect display for everyone else to see how strong the humans are now. These are the two strongest humans going at it. Ten's got a slight advantage in power, but Krillin's got a slight advantage in techniques. That doesn't mean Ten has bad techniques or strategy. It just makes the fight very close. It's an explosive battle, and the craziest part is no one could even sense it going on. Obviously, the others knew that they can't sense androids, but it's just weird seeing Krillin and Shinon fighting and not being able to sense them. That's something that they would normally be able to feel. They make great use of their infinite energy, too. They can use all their techniques and abilities to their fullest power. They don't have to hold anything back anymore. They no longer need to worry about running out of energy or stamina. And then Ten tries something he hasn't in a while. First, he activates the Four Witches technique. He gets two extra arms on his back, which gives him an advantage against Krillin. And even though this has split up his power, he uses the multi-form. This helps trip up Krillin. There's four of him, 12 eyes watching Krillin, and 16 arms fighting against him. Krillin puts up a good fight, and eventually this ends in a beam strike. The four then eats on Koho, and Krillin has only one way to fend them off. He charges a scatter Kamehameha, launching it upwards as it falls back down, trying to block all the beams at once. But with four versus one, it makes it a bit hard, and Ten ends up winning the fight. Everyone else is hyped to fight too. This is a great start to the tournament, but unfortunately it does get crashed by Spopovich and Yamu, and a lot of that goes pretty much normal. They steal Gohan's energy, Shin and Kabito reveal themselves, and you know the rest. But with the humans here, this is going to have a huge effect on what happens next. First of all, they have three extra people joining them, Chen Shinhan, Yamcha, and Chaozu, and of course Krillin's obviously still there. The three Saiyans are ready for what's ahead too. Vegeta and Gohan are a bit stronger than normal, and as for Goku, he's still done the same training that he did in Otherworld. So even if they are going to face a threat, it doesn't really matter. When Deborah spots everyone, he's actually a bit concerned. They have so many fighters here against them. If he's going to do a sneak attack, he needs to work quickly and swiftly. He can't hesitate and he has to choose who to kill. He aims for Kibito, but his sneak attack is stopped before it even happens. 
With how amazing his eyesight is, Ten's able to pick up subtle movements from Deborah before he even attacks. Deborah appears in front of everyone with a beam charge, ready to kill Kibito, but Ten jumps in front quickly, launching his own beam to counter it. Shin and Kibito are concerned at first, obviously because Deborah is very strong, but if they fight him, they're just going to be giving off energy, but Ten tells them not to worry. The humans don't have energy that can be stolen. Sure, they still have some organic key left, but a lot of their energy now is mechanical, and Shin's amazed to hear this. That's right, there's no way they could steal their energy from Boo. And although the Saiyans are ready to fight, as well as Piccolo, they're kind of put to the side. Shin says they need to be extra safe about this. The humans are going to go fight everyone, and if they need help, the Saiyans can jump in. But this is great. They won't be giving off any energy. The only energy there will be from the other people that they're fighting. Deborah's already retreated back into the ship, and the four humans rush in and storm the ship. Pui Pui's not an issue, nor is Yakon. The main event is Deborah himself. And even though the humans are strong, one of them alone might not be enough to take on Deborah. Ten realized it before when he countered that attack. He was using his maximum power to deflect that, and who knows if Deborah was using his full power at that point. Yamcha and Krillin decide to step up together and tell Chaozu to support them from the sides. Deborah chuckles, ready to fight them. He draws his sword out and launches towards them, but midair he then freezes. He drops his guard, and he looks over. Chaozu has his hand out, freezing Deborah midair. Deborah's guard was too low. He tries breaking free from it, but it's already too late. Yamcha and Krillin begin attacking him together. The two first start with a combo attack of kicks and punches, working with some amazing synergy, and then they break out some of their own special techniques. Krillin hits Deborah with an uppercut, sending him upwards and then throwing a Kienzan towards him. Deborah is only barely able to dodge, and it ends up cutting his face a bit, but this is more so a distraction. Deborah is then hit in the back of the head with something. It's a spirit ball from Yamcha. Yamcha begins swinging his fingers around directing the ball, and he even creates another one too. Both of the attacks are strong, and it keeps Deborah basically stunned midair while Krillin charges his own attack. He launches a massive Kamehameha at Deborah, and at the last second before it hits, Deborah powers up and tries to break free, slicing the beam in half. But then he's hit in the back by two more powerful beams. Ten has joined too. He and Chaozu stuck together, launching Dodonpas. And now Deborah is getting pissed off. And that means Deborah is getting sloppy right now. Oh, that sounds kind of weird out of context. Master Bobbery, I'm getting f***ing head right now. Very well, da- What? What the f*** are you doing, Dabara? Need I explain any more, Master Bobbity? No, I can clearly see what you're doing. Just don't do it so close to Martin Boo's egg. With four incredible fighters against him, he's getting overwhelmed. And the four of them all attack together at once. And with this combined effort, they defeat him, finally making their way to the bottom of the ship, finding Bobbity. And obviously, he's pretty easy to kill. He didn't even get close to the energy he needed. He only got what he got from Gohan. Shin and Kibito breathe a sigh of relief, glad that this all went well. It's pretty interesting to see how strong these Earthlings are. Yeah, it's pretty natural that the Saiyans are strong, but they're impressed with these Earthlings. Who knows, maybe this isn't the last they see of them, and with the peace restored, they all go back to the tournament, and of course it still had to go on without them. And luckily for Krillin, his wife ended up winning. Or at least, she almost won, but then fell to Mr. Satan. But they both got paid, so it doesn't even matter. And Goku's finally able to spar with everyone too, while also getting to spend some time with his family. Unfortunately, because they did stop Boo, it's a double-edged sword. Goku's gonna stay dead, at least for the time being. But they're glad they at least got to see him again. And actually, this is the perfect chance. Krillin asks, is there any way he can get into contact with King Kai and get them to train with him? Oh yeah, Goku says that won't be hard at all. Once he's back in Otherworld, he'll be sure to tell King Kai. And they'll work out the details. This is great. Krillin's hyped up to train with him, hoping that he can learn Kaio Ken. And Yamcha's even excited to join too. But surprisingly, Ten says that he doesn't want to go. Why not? This was his idea after all. Well, he actually has a better idea in mind. He was speaking to the Kais before, and they decided they'll actually take him on as a student. He's going to be training under Shin and Kibito. But he does wish them the best with King Kai. That should work pretty well, and they will get to see Goku. As for Vegeta, Gohan, and Piccolo, they're going to continue with their own things here on Earth. But with how strong the humans are getting, they're going to try not to fall behind. Especially Vegeta. And just because Vegeta wanted it so badly, Vegeta and Goku end up fighting too. And instead of a deathmatch, it's an all-out battle that's pretty friendly. I mean, we've given the humans enough good stuff. we got to throw Vegeta a bone too. Goku even shows off Super Saiyan 3. He knows Goku was holding back, so he pressured Goku into using it. It lets Vegeta know that Goku's ahead, but Vegeta's content. He got the fight that he wanted, and now he has another goal to work towards. Maybe Super Saiyan 3 would be nice for him. And especially with what's about to come next, they're going to need as much power as they can get. So as we left off in the last part, everyone is going to do their own training. In terms of Yamcha, Chaozu, and Krillin, they end up going to King Kai. This will actually work out pretty well for them. They know King Kai's got some great training in store, especially after seeing what he did with Goku. And now with their android powers, this should make it a lot better for them too. Specifically, the one thing that they want to try and train for is Kaioken. They know it could be very beneficial for them. And unlike something like Super Saiyan, 
This is a power of Gokus that they've seen and can access, and unlike Goku, they actually do have an advantage. Not only are they much stronger than Goku when he first learned Kaioken, but also, they have been here with King Kai before. It isn't their first time seeing him. Plus, since they're androids, Kaioken might actually work way better for them than anyone else. Just think about it. Kaioken is very draining in terms of stamina, and it literally tears your body apart if you use it at too high of a level for too long. For these three, it would still be cause for concern in some ways. But since they have infinite energy, they don't need to be worried about Kaioken making them tired. Plus, once they were upgraded to be androids, their bodies became a lot stronger too, being reinforced by the different materials within them. They didn't just get stronger in terms of their training and ki, but their bodies physically became stronger, even if they have their ki dropped. Of course, Kaioken still can't injure their body if they use it for too long at too high of a level, but the effects are a bit mitigated by them being androids, especially because it's not draining in terms of stamina. All of this combined basically means that right off the bat, they could use Kaioken and learn it really quickly. They just need to build up more of a resistance. 50 times Kaioken is actually pretty realistic for them at this point, and it's something that they could learn pretty quickly. Lower levels of Kaioken would be very easy to pull off, especially thanks to all their training beforehand and their android body. So at the moment, they could use pretty much anything up to times 50, even going to times 100 if they need, although that's a bit more strenuous. But again, there's no worry for stamina drain. They mainly just have to focus on making Kaioken not injure themselves. And once they figure out a way to do that, they'll be able to ascend to even higher levels. King Kai is amazed when he sees all this. It's not the first person he's seen use Kaioken, obviously. But these people are the first that are actually using it this efficiently. If they had regeneration like Piccolo, it would be a very different story and they'd basically be able to max this out to way higher levels than what they are at now. But still, this is great. And obviously, they're not the only ones training. Let's actually go back to Earth for a bit. Vegeta's actually training more and more. Obviously, he'd be training regardless, but with all that's happened so far in the scenario, he's even more motivated than before. At the moment, he's actually pretty much the strongest person on Earth, which of course gives him a nice ego boost, but still, there's two huge issues with that. One, he knows Kakarot is still stronger than him. When he fought Kakarot before, he was so much more powerful. As we saw, Goku was still training in Otherworld and got some brand new powers. Specifically Super Saiyan 3, which Vegeta wants to try and learn for himself. But also, everyone else is getting stronger at such a rapid rate. Even though Vegeta might be the strongest person alive right now, he doesn't feel that way. He needs to surpass Kakarot, but also he needs to stay ahead of the humans. And he has a great idea of how to do that. Besides just getting Super Saiyan 3, he needs a training partner, someone strong, someone that's built like him, and someone who he could work off of in terms of strategy and power. He found the perfect person for that. It's Gohan. Of course, Gohan's been slacking on training a bit. Not as much as he did in the main story, but still, he is kind of slacking here. But Vegeta sees such great potential in him. He even said so in the main series. And if he were to train with Gohan, imagine the great things that they could do together. He proposes this idea. Just think about it. These two are the strongest Saiyans left on Earth. The only way they'll access new powers is if they work together. As Saiyans, they function similarly. Sure, Gohan has greater potential, but at the core of it, their transformations are pretty much the same. Gohan's also pretty smart too, both in battle smarts and academic smarts. Combine that with Vegeta's dedication and great strategy, and you'll have an incredibly efficient and powerful duo there. It takes a bit of convincing, but Gohan ends up joining Vegeta. He's right. Everyone needs to be as strong as possible in case something bad happens to Earth. I mean, look what almost happened with Boo. If any other threat arrives in the future, they need to be at peak performance. And not only that, but a stronger Saiyan would be a lot cooler too. This would not only help him protect the people close to him, but the entire Earth as well. Oh yeah, and there's an added bonus with this. Piccolo joins in on the training too, since he mostly works with Gohan anyways. The three of them stick together as Vegeta tries to figure out Super Saiyan 3. And eventually both he and Gohan access this. But they immediately come to see that there's some glaring flaws with it. It's great for some short bursts in power, but beyond that, it's not really usable in long battles, and they need to figure out a way around that. Gohan says they did it with regular Super Saiyan before. Maybe they could find a workaround for this, make it more efficient and get rid of the Kili. But we're forgetting someone. What's happening with Tenshinhan? As discussed last time, he ended up going with Shin and Kibito for their training. He felt like this would be a better course for him. Sure, he knows King Kai's training would have been very valuable regardless, but still, training with the Supreme Kai instead sounds way more thrilling. And who knows, maybe he could pick up some crazy powers there. Some sort of ultimate ability that'll be his own. And while they're there, Shin actually knows something interesting. Well, it's pretty obvious too. Why does he have three eyes? And in this scenario, I'm gonna try something to make things a bit more interesting. Yes, I know there's a lot of conflicting sources about this, and a lot of them point towards the eye being a spiritual sort of awakening, but I'm gonna use some of the other explanations and say that Tenshinhan's actually part alien, making it very diluted in his blood, but still there. And Shin thinks this is pretty fascinating. He's part Triclops. Unlike the other Earthlings, he might actually have a great advantage. Since he's part alien, not only would he have greater potential, but maybe he can access powers that other people can't use, certain forms or techniques specific to him. I mean, he already has some of them. He has his third eye, and he's used the Four Witches technique which no one else has copied. Just as Saiyans have their own forms, maybe he'll have his own. 
but they're going to have to train a lot more for that. Thankfully, he's able to pull out the Z-Sword, and that's what he does most of his training with. It's weird, he never really expected to fight with a sword, but this seems pretty powerful, and it's a great way to train himself. He gets more discipline and strength than this. And also, the Kai's can teach more than beyond just power. They have some pretty great techniques, specifically magical techniques, and Ten's interested in this. Learning magic would be a huge help in battle. If he learned how to use magic and was able to use it strategically, it could change the tide of any battle. Plus, there's other valuable things he could learn, such as the Kai Kai. Being able to teleport instantaneously like Goku does, that would be great, but he still has a long way to go before he does that. He seems really motivated, and Shin and Kabito like having him as a student. He's very disciplined, and although he was very misguided in the past, he's definitely much more good at heart now than he was then. Maybe this guy could be a student of theirs, a full-time apprentice if anything. It changes Kabito's views on morals completely. I mean, he already saw them on Earth and saw them in action, but this one's acting so disciplined and respectful, and his power and strategy in battle is amazing. Maybe it would be a good idea to take him under their wing. All of this training continues, up until the arrival of a brand new character. At some point, Beerus eventually awakens from his nap, and he has some pretty interesting thoughts in his mind. Besides just having that dream about the Super Saiyan God, he heard something about Shin from Whis. Apparently, he's taken on a student. They're training some guy from Earth to be the next Apprentice Kai. Really? An Earthling as a Supreme Kai? That's weird. He must be pretty special for them to train him. But still, the thing about the Super Saiyan God, he wants to pursue that dream. It might have been a prophecy of some sorts. Maybe he'll find a new rival. He needs to pursue this Super Saiyan God. Whether it's real or not, he just needs to know. And according to Whis, it seems like there are some Saiyans on Earth. No Super Saiyan Gods that he knows of. But there are some strong Saiyans there. That would be his best chance at finding a Super Saiyan God. So, he decides to go there. But first, he makes a stop at the Sacred World of Kai's, meeting the student of Shin. He's actually pretty impressed with Ten's powers. He's learned some great Kai techniques. And with the Z-Sword in hand, he's got a very powerful weapon too. But even with all that, he's still in the match for Beerus. And Ten actually gets kind of worried about this, as do Shin and Kabita. The fact that Beerus is awake could spell some issues for everyone. Like, just think about it. Beerus is a pretty loose cannon as of now. And now he's going around trying to find a new rival. And apparently, the people that he's looking for are actually the people that are on Ten's home planet. He tells them what he's planning. He wants to find a Super Saiyan God, and he knows exactly where to go next. He asks Ten. He wouldn't happen to know a Vegeta or Gohan, would he? They seem to be the two strongest Saiyans at the moment, and as far as they know, two of the few Saiyans that are still alive, actually. And Ten does know him. There's no point in lying to Beerus. He is going to end up going to Earth anyways. Well, that's perfect, actually. Maybe Ten can go back to Earth with them, just to introduce everyone to Beerus. Well, Vegeta won't need any introduction, but as for everyone else, it'll be nice to have Ten there. Reluctantly, he goes along. And just to make things faster, Shin actually teleports everyone back to Earth. And obviously everyone's surprised to see Beerus arrive there. But more so, they're surprised to hear what he has to say. There's something called a Super Saiyan God, and that makes Vegeta very interested. He was a bit terrified when he saw Beerus here, but this might actually lead him to something special. He asks if Vegeta knows anything about the Super Saiyan God, and Vegeta's mood instantly changes. Damn, he thought Beerus was going to be the one to tell him about a Super Saiyan God, not ask about it. Vegeta tells Beerus that he doesn't know anything about it. So now, what are they supposed to do? Beerus isn't pissed off like he was originally, so it's not like they're pressed for time here but Beerus does want to know about a Super Saiyan God. They could ask Shenron, but Whis has a better idea. Maybe he could do some research. There's definitely some places around the universe that have this documented somewhere. There's gotta be something he could consult. Whether it be using the Wish Orbs, whether it be going to Namek and using the Namekian Book of Legends, or going to Zuno even. Oh wait, that's a perfect idea. He does exactly that. He tells everyone he'll be right back. And after a few minutes, he returns, and has the info about what a Super Saiyan God is. Apparently, you could either do a ritual, or you need to train with access to God Key for it. And obviously, they're not going to be able to do the ritual. They don't have enough Saiyans for it. It's a shame, too. If Goku were here, they would have exactly enough. And they could bring him back, but they already did bring him back for a day a while ago in the Buu Saga. Well, actually, they don't know they have exactly enough, because Videl doesn't reveal she's pregnant. So they think it's a lost cause regardless. And instead, they decide they're going to go with the other option, training with God Key. Maybe Vegeta could actually do that. And Beerus invites Gohan, too. He seems strong. And if he has two Super Saiyan gods, that would be even better. But Gohan still has to stay here. He has a bunch of responsibilities on Earth and can't just go away. But that's fine. Vegeta's gonna end up going with Beerus and Whis to train for Super Saiyan God. And meanwhile, everyone's gonna continue everything else. And Vegeta's glad about this. This literally dropped right in his hands. It's just what he needed. A special kind of training for himself only. And he's gonna unlock a new power that only he's gonna have. He's gonna be the number one again. And no matter what danger comes their way, with the power of a Super Saiyan God, nothing will stop him. But interestingly enough, he's going to end up finding a new rival. Beerus actually wanted to do this because he wanted a student of his own. Once he saw that Shin had a student, he thought that would be a great idea if he had his own. 
even before he found out it was the key to getting a Super Saiyan God. With Vegeta as his student, not only is Vegeta gonna get stronger, but Beerus is gonna get bragging rights. Why is he doing this? Just because it's fun to be an ass to Shin. Well, partially. Mostly because it's mutually beneficial for everyone. And in a way, Vegeta's found a new rival in Tenshinhan. Both students of gods going down different paths. Vegeta knows what he's trying to access, but what's Ten going for? Unbeknownst to them, Earth is about to face a brand new threat. But even without them there, Earth should be okay. Consider who's still there. Krillin, Yamcha, and Tatsu are very close to Earth and can leave King Kai's planet whenever they want. And as for Gohan, he's right there on Earth. The plans for Earth's revival are still in motion. And even without Vegeta and Tenshinhan there, they're still gonna have people to defend Earth. As you'd probably expect, not much is gonna change with his revival itself. His soldiers are gonna go in, get the Dragon Balls and revive him, and Frieza's gonna take a few months of training. And what's pretty funny to him is that Goku's already dead, so that's one less person to worry about. And it actually does get to his head a bit. That only leaves Vegeta in those pesky Earthlings. Maybe he doesn't need to train for four months. Maybe he can go for even less. And he'll take any excuse he can get. I mean, he hates training. If he's only fighting a few of them, he doesn't need to train for as long as he thought he did. But that mistake's definitely gonna come back to bite him. And he sees that once he actually goes to Earth. By the time his army arrives, the only people they're defending are Gohan, Piccolo, and Roshi. And Jocko too, of course. The three humans that are with King Kai are gonna be a bit late, but they'll be here in a few minutes or so. And this makes Frieza laugh. There's only a few of them defending. There's no way they're gonna stand a chance. And against Frieza's army, it's pretty easy. Even though it's four versus dozens and dozens of soldiers, they win, and they win pretty effortlessly, in fact. All right, so that means Frieza just has to step up to the plate. And Gohan decides to take charge. He knows that Frieza's probably been alive for a while. He saw what happened before when someone summoned Shenron. And Gohan has a completely different plan in mind. Frieza's still in his first form. And simply, Gohan just transforms into Super Saiyan 3. Instantly eradicating Frieza, not even allowing him to fight back. Hold on, wait, isn't that just a bit anticlimactic? Well, yeah, kinda, but consider what this whole scenario is about. The whole reason everyone turned into androids is because they were worried about what's gonna happen to Earth. Without Goku there, they need to be really smart in defending Earth. It's the whole reason they wanted to become stronger. Same with Gohan and everyone else, too. And yeah, they might be strong, but who knows how strong Frieza was? They're not gonna take that risk. It was a smart move to just eradicate him right away. Maybe they would've been able to fight him, but they don't know, and they didn't wanna test that theory. They can't get too cocky. Their whole motive is trying to defend Earth and make themselves stronger, and that's gonna be pointless if they just let someone get ahead because it would make for a better fight. They need to think smarter, and that's exactly what Gohan is doing here. But don't worry, even though Resurrection F might've been a bit anticlimactic, we'll be seeing a lot more things going forward. And let's just say things are gonna get pretty crazy. After the events of the last part, not much is going on. Everyone is basically up to the same training that they've been doing. But Vegeta receives some pretty interesting news. He finds out that Beerus actually has a brother. Shampa visits Beerus' planet, seeing his new student as well. And just as the two usually do, they start fighting, which then leads to a tournament being conceptualized. They have to settle this feud somehow, and Vegeta suggests this tournament. And that means he now has to find a team of five. That actually shouldn't be too hard. There's a bunch of strong people around him that he could find. And Beerus isn't too worried either. He wonders who Shampa's gonna find. But as for Universe 7, they should be perfectly okay. Actually, it seems like they have too many people. They have so many good fighters that they don't really know who to choose from. Vegeta tells Beerus not to worry. He'll survey the strongest and get the best team possible. Obviously, his first pick will be Tenshinhan. The two of them are sorta rivals now, but not really. Although he knows Ten's getting some pretty great training, so he's gonna be a good asset to the team. And obviously, Gohan's gonna be another pick. After seeing his power firsthand and training with Gohan a bit even on Earth, Vegeta knows he'd be a great option for the team. He only needs two more people. He could get Piccolo on the team, but also there's some pretty strong humans left too. Although he thinks it might be beneficial to have the most diverse team possible. He could have just made an entire team full of androids. But who knows, Piccolo's Namekian abilities might be useful. There's Piccolo, Yamcha, Krillin, Android 18, Chiaotzu. So he doesn't really know who to pick. Gohan suggests they just recruit Piccolo and Krillin. That way they have a bunch of fighters that do different things. Awesome, that works out. The team's all set now. And they head into the tournament. Just as I usually do for my videos, I'm gonna go through the tournament pretty quickly. We don't really need all the fine details, and honestly, it would be better to just get onto the next arc because that's the most interesting. And also, this tournament's gonna go by pretty easily, so it's not like we really need to spend much time on it. First up is Krillin. And even though Batamo might be tricky to fight, Krillin's pretty strategic and smart. He'll figure out a way to defeat him pretty easily. Power's not an issue either. It's just figuring a way to get him out of the ring. As for Frost, power is also not an issue there. But Frost's poison is pretty tricky to work around. Krillin doesn't notice it at first and he's knocked out. Piccolo's then up next. And he's able to discern Frost's poison after he's stung by it. This means Frost is disqualified, and sadly this means Piccolo's gonna have to sit out too, but he's gonna get another chance at the end once he's fully healed. Krillin's also gonna be reinstated afterwards because he was knocked out unfairly. So technically, their team hasn't had anyone eliminated yet. Gohan's up next against Megeta. 
Gohan was looking forward to showing off his training, but against Mageta he can't really do that. Similar to Batamo, Mageta just can't take any damage at all, at least not physically. Gohan needs to inflict some emotional damage. And I'm sure Gohan can come up with some pretty unique insults, also profusely apologizing afterwards. Mageta's defeated and next Gohan fights Kappa. There's not too much interesting about this fight either. Gohan doesn't really have a reason to teach Kappa Super Saiyan, it might not even cross his mind. Of course, he would be surprised to see a Universe 6 Saiyan, and surprised to hear that he doesn't have Super Saiyan at all. Kappa would hear about it, but he wouldn't learn it at all. Gohan probably couldn't think of a way to teach him it, and there wouldn't really be enough time for him anyways. It's a friendly fight, but it ends pretty quickly. Gohan's up against Hit next, and pretty quickly it becomes apparent that Hit's way too much for Gohan to face. His time skip is an issue, although Gohan realizes that he's not going to be doing any damage, so he's going to go on the defensive here. He wants to stay in the ring as long as possible so he can learn Hit's technique, trying to see if he can give tips to whoever's next. He's eliminated, but he's gathered some good info. Vegeta's next, and he tries to put this to use. And even though Vegeta does know Hit's tricks now, this is still going to be a bit tough. Vegeta's very strong in the scenario still, but I'd like to say that he's weaker than normal here. Think about it, he's been training alone with Beerus and Whis, he hasn't had a training partner like Goku. This isn't to say he's weak, just weaker than his canon counterpart. Combine this with the fact that Hit is just too powerful to keep up with, and it will make things tough for Vegeta. He might be able to get some attacks in at first, but I still feel like Hit would take this round. Next up, Ten faces Hit. In terms of raw strength, he might not be able to match up to Hit here, even with his great training and all, but in terms of technique, he can more than make up for it. Knowing Hit's strategies, he's found a way around it. First of all, with his precise vision, he's able to see small movements that Hit makes, being able to figure out when he's time skipping an attack, and by now he's also picking up the Kai Kai, able to freely teleport around the ring, avoiding Hit's attacks. He combines all this with the knowledge that he got from watching Gohan and Vegeta fight him. He might not be able to beat Hit physically, but he can beat him in terms of strategy. He performs a solar flare, able to blind Hit. Hit says this isn't going to stop him, but as his vision clears up, he sees a bunch of Tenshinhans around him. Even everyone in the stands is confused. Did he split himself up that much? He has dozens of clones. They think he split up his power all those ways. But really, those aren't clones. Those are illusions. There's dozens of fake copies of him around the ring. Utilizing magic, he was able to make dummies out of Kachi. And by lowering his own key as well, Hit can't tell which one is which. All the clones start moving too, trying to trip Hit up. Manipulating them, Ten begins teleporting all of them around rapidly, including himself. Even when Hit does attack a fake one, he's not sure because it keeps teleporting away. He is quick and his time skip does help him, but with so many fakes and not knowing which one's the real one, this is getting on his nerves. But it's a perfect distraction. Amidst all this chaos, Ten jumps up in the air, performing a massive Kikoha. This attack is normally incredibly draining for him, but as an android, that doesn't matter now. He's using it at full power, able to launch it for as long as he likes. Hit is bombarded by multiple Kikohos, all in a rapid succession. He has his arms up guarding it, and he doesn't take too much damage from it, but everyone's surprised because it's announced that he's eliminated. With all those attacks, Ten destroyed a bunch of the ring, and even though Hit wasn't too damaged by this, or actually flung out of the ring, he still isn't in the ring anymore. And on that technicality, Universe 7 takes the win. But this leaves some pretty interesting consequences for the next arc. Of course, Zamas is watching all of this. You could say he's intrigued, but more so he's angered. Probably even more than usual. Not only is godly power being made a mockery of with Vegeta, but the humans are playing gods too. They've been modifying themselves. At first he didn't even realize it, but apparently that one human is a student of Akai, and it's because he was turned into an android. These humans have been trying to create stronger humans. Do they think they're Kais or something? It's disgusting. Zamasu's revolted, and he's going to take this into his own hands. One day, Vegeta's back on Earth training. He's spending some time with his family. He's been on Beerus' planet for far too long, and after the tournament he did need some time back on Earth. But that doesn't mean he's not training. He's still trying to get stronger and stronger than before. Now with access to Super Saiyan Blue, he needs to improve this somehow. But as he's training, he then feels weird. In a nearby window he looks, his reflection, he looks completely different. And in the reflection, he sees someone appear behind him. It's himself. Zamasu has stolen Vegeta's body, and he Kai Kai's in right behind Vegeta. Vegeta doesn't know who this is, but he doesn't even ask questions. He immediately attacks the imposter. For a brief moment, he is able to put up a fight. But Zamasu does have Vegeta's body, which is way stronger than his own. He's able to then kill Vegeta. He goes around the rest of Capsicorp too, killing everyone that tries to stand up against him. The Earthlings all rush over, as well as all the other fighters. They're not sure what's going on, but the entire Earth begins rumbling. Vegeta Black has launched an attack right towards its core, leaving a nice parting gift as he travels off to another time. Everyone is killed, at least in that one instance. Of course, Vegeta Black finds his way over to Future Trunks' timeline, and in that timeline, Zamasu becomes immortal, commencing the Zero Mortals plan. Outside of the fact that it's Vegeta Black and not Goku Black, not much here is different. Luckily, our main timeline is still safe. Trunks ends up traveling there for help. Everyone's surprised to learn about what's happening. 
Somehow Vegeta is alive in the future, and he's going around killing everyone. This all sounds weird. They thought Vegeta died in that timeline, and Trunks says he did. He's sure of it. That's why he couldn't believe it when he saw it. His own father going around doing this. At first, it was distracting. A little bit traumatic, too. He sees Vegeta's face as he torments everyone. But that's how he came to realize it. That wasn't Vegeta. It's some sort of clone. Some imposter of some sorts. Someone that just looks like Vegeta somehow. And whoever he is, Trunks doesn't care. They need to kill him as soon as possible. This is not only a huge threat, but it's also personal. Trunks is also surprised to learn about what's happened here. Goku is still dead, obviously. But apparently, Vegeta's been training with some new gods. And the humans have become androids somehow. Weird, they were fighting the androids before, and now they are the androids. Plus, the 17 and 18 in this timeline are completely good. Well, they assume 17 is, they haven't seen him in a while. It's strange for him to learn all about this, and they hear about what's been going on in his timeline too. Of course, nothing with Trunks would have changed here. The only difference for him is that Vegeta Black is attacking his timeline, not Goku Black. And it's good timing too, because around the time that all this is happening, Vegeta Black then teleports in. And as you'd probably expect, Vegeta is immediately infuriated launching over and attacking the fake Vegeta. Vegeta Black wanted to make a grandiose introduction, but that's not gonna pan out too well. Vegeta even mocks him. At his current strength, Vegeta Black is nothing to him. And Vegeta Black admits it. He's right. He can't do anything at this current level. So, he randomly departs. Vegeta's just standing there amazed. He really retreated. What a little bitch. Whatever, they'll find him again. And eventually they all do return to the future. Vegeta heads back with Trunks, and Ten decides to go along with him too. They could bring more people, but it might be too much of a hassle. And they're also concerned that he might show up back here, so Gohan's gonna stay back with some of the other humans, just in case Vegeta Black appears again. And this is happening almost immediately after, too. The time machine was never destroyed since Vegeta made such quick work of Vegeta Black. Plus, that means Vegeta Black's also pretty injured still. He is eventually going to get healed. But since this is all happening so quick, it's basically right after he gets back. Vegeta, Trunk, and Ten immediately go in and begin attacking him. And they also learn of Zamasu as well. He's right there at the time that they return. So they decide to split up. They still need to learn about all this too and see what's going on. Vegeta and Trunks face Vegeta Black, while Ten goes to face Zamasu. He can clearly see that Zamasu's a Kai, and he wants to figure out what's going on. Zamasu is surprised. This human's apparently a student of the Kais. He comes to see that he has the same techniques too. He's able to Kai Kai. He's able to use some magic too. This must mean he has the ability to heal as well. And Zamasu doesn't find this fascinating. This infuriates him even more than Vegeta. Ten's able to get some info about Zamasu and figure out what's going on. And he also comes to learn that Zamasu's immortal. And after trying to kill Zamasu for so long, that kind of answers the question of why he won't die. And even though he's still not too familiar with the Kais from other universes, he does know this is going to cause some issues back in their universe. He's heard of Zamasu before, and he knows that they immediately have to alert Goasu and the other Kais too. But right now, he has to figure out a way to defeat Zamasu. But how is he supposed to do that? Wait, if he's immortal, he knows the perfect way to do this, and doesn't require any Kai techniques or whatever. Well, maybe a little bit. In his hands, he makes a jar made out of Kachi. With one hand, he paralyzes Zamasu midair, and in the other, he generates a seal. Zamasu doesn't know what he's up to, and he keeps trying to escape the paralysis. Vegeta Black trying to get over to help, but he's having a tough time facing Vegeta in trunks. Ten places the jar down, and while Zamasu's paralyzed in front of him, he sticks his hands out. He yells Mafuba, sealing Zamasu away in this jar. Vegeta Black looks over in complete shock. What just happened? Ten says that he's sealed away for good. Even though he's immortal, that doesn't mean he can't be defeated. Vegeta and Trunks commend him for his quick thinking, and now they just need to kill Vegeta Black, which shouldn't be too hard. Even though he did get healed and got stronger from that, he's fighting three people now. But Vegeta Black's enraged. His whole plan is falling apart, and he's being mocked by these three. And this anger, it'll allow him to ascend to a new power. He's surrounded by a dark pinkish aura, and his key explodes. He turns Super Saiyan Rose, not even sure of what he just did or what this power is, but he doesn't care. He immediately launches towards Ten, trying to grab the jar from him. Everyone is just as confused as Vegeta Black. They have no idea what this pink-haired form is. And because of that, they don't know how strong he is. But they come up with a plan. They're gonna fake a retreat. Maybe they can coax him into coming back into the past again. By going back there, they could probably get help from Beerus and Whis, as well as getting some of the other fighters involved. They're able to create a distraction, then heading back to that timeline. But they have to work quick. Ten Kai Kai is over to Beerus and Whis, quickly explaining everything, and he gives them the jar with Zamasu in it. Beerus knew something was suspicious about that Vegeta Black guy mainly his connection to the Kais, and this really explains it all. He's gonna dispose of this container and deal with Zamasu in this timeline too. Wait, he's not gonna help them? Well, he will help them. He'll help with the Zamasu aspect. They think he's gonna go back there and Hakai Vegeta Black? Well, he might, but it's more so their concern. He trusts they can handle it. He and Whis depart, and this means Ten needs a new plan. He teleports back to Earth, quickly healing everyone as fast as possible. Vegeta and Trunks already filled everyone in. Yamcha, Chaozu, and Gohan are already there, and Krillin and 18 are gonna get there soon. They don't know when Vegeta Black is going to arrive, but they know he's going to eventually. They'll ambush him right when he gets here. 
They wait for a few minutes. A portal opens in the sky, and immediately they start attacking. First, Ten encases Vegeta Black's arms on Kachi. He's only got one shot at this. He's doing this to catch him off guard and steal the time ring. He's successful. Vegeta Black breaks free from the Kachi out of anger. Now he has no means of escaping, but he doesn't care. He knows he'll win here. The entire group powers up. Vegeta Black's now on his last legs. He's been injured before, and even with this power up, he doesn't have anyone to heal him. Everyone else here is at full strength, fighting together alongside allies. As Ten heals Vegeta and Trunks, Gohan holds him off first, with the rest then joining in. The other humans and Piccolo help too. He might be strong, but he's not strong enough to take on all of them at once. And Vegeta lets him know this. He might have the same body as him, he might look like him, but he's not Vegeta. Even though he can mock Vegeta, he'll never be the real thing. And because of that, this is where he loses. Vegeta Black's getting angrier and angrier, and he's able to summon more power, but it's still not enough. He's being injured at such a great rate. And without the time ring, he's losing stability, and he has no means of escaping. Ten then hits him with a massive Kikoho, not only injuring Vegeta Black, but holding him midair. Ten continuously launches this, not faltering at all. Gohan and Trunks then jump to the side, each hitting Vegeta Black with their own Masenka. He's being hit from three different angles, and he tries to push it back, but he can't. And then he sends his energy below him. It's Vegeta. He aims his hands directly upwards. Ki courses through the entire area, breaking up the ground below him. He launches a massive final flash directly up into the sky. Vegeta Black's now being hit from four different angles, and this final flash is what finishes it. A massive pillar of key flies out of the atmosphere, going off into space. Nothing is left of Vegeta Black. They did it. They defeated Vegeta Black, and now Trunks can return back to his timeline. And Beerus and Whis arrive back just after this. It's like he said, he knew they could handle it. They didn't need his help. He's impressed to see how far Vegeta's come, but is also equally intrigued by Shin's student and Shinhan. Following the previous arc, now we're going to be entering the Tournament of Power, at least after a brief time skip. Everyone's training continues. Vegeta and Ten's unlikely rivalry flourishes. Ten tries to access a new power for himself, while Vegeta is also trying to ascend the power of Super Saiyan Blue. But as for Ten, he's going for something different, obviously. He's doing something that no one else has done before. Thanks to the fact that he's an android and a Triclops, he could probably unlock something that no one else has seen before. And that's the issue. He doesn't know exactly what he's pursuing. He's using godly powers, working with Kai's. He's a hybrid between human and Triclops. But what exactly is he going to unlock, and when will he be able to use it? He continues working towards whatever this power is, knowing that there is something in there, and he's on the cusp of unlocking. A year passes, and eventually, Zeno's getting pretty bored. He remembers, though, that tournament he saw before between Universe 6 and Universe 7. Even though they did it without his permission, maybe it would be fun if he held one, something official between the multiverse. And hey, it'll be a great way to test the mortals, too. So not only will he get entertained, but he'll be able to judge all the universes. So, the Tournament of Power is set into place. Of course, every universe is surprised to hear about this, and thankfully Universe 7 isn't painted as an enemy. But there is kind of an issue, the fact that they need 10 members. Beerus is a bit concerned. Obviously, he places this bird on Vegeta since Vegeta is the only one near him at the moment. So, he's going to have to start recruiting people. Thankfully, it's not too hard for him to find some. He works with Ten Shinhan and they all go around Earth. The rest of the androids are recruited. Yamcha, Krillin, Chaozu, 18, and even 17. 18 has already been training, which is pretty great, so she is a bit stronger than normal. And 17 is 17. His strength is obviously pretty great already. Piccolo is another pretty obvious pick, as is Gohan. So right there, they already have 9 people. So, who should they go for for the 10? I mean, they could ask Roshi, or they could ask Goten or Trunks, but they're not too sure. It might be a bit hard for Roshi to keep up with everyone, and as for Goten and Trunks, they definitely are powerful, but they don't have the experience that they need for this. But Beerus says they need to hurry up. Krillin's a bit concerned too. Damn, it would be great if they just had Goku here with them. Wait a second, that's actually a great idea. What, Goku? He's dead, they can't have him on the team. Beerus has always heard about this Goku guy. Obviously he's never met him, but if they need him back on the team, he turns to Whis and sees if he could do anything. Whis briefly departs for a moment, and soon enough, he comes back. And everyone is completely speechless when they see that Goku standing beside him, still with the halo above his head. Whis isn't bringing him back to life just yet, but I mean, he's an angel. It's not too hard for him to get someone in the afterlife. If Baba can do it, he definitely can. He already filled Goku in, and Goku did know a bit about this too, thanks to some info from King Kai. And he's hyped up, he's ready to join the team. Obviously everyone's mostly focused on the fact that Goku's back. And since they have some time before the tournament, they do get some time to actually hang out with him a bit. It's been so long since they've seen him, and it's great to have him back, even if it's temporary. But Vegeta's curious, how strong has Kakarot grown in the afterlife? He's seen before, but he wonders if Kakarot's around his level now. I mean, Vegeta's a god now. It would have been interesting to see Kakarot pursue the same power. Oh, a Super Saiyan god? Well yeah, he heard all about this from King Kai. King Kai's been giving constant updates about what's happening in the living world, and Goku was definitely interested in this. It did take a while, but after all the time spent in Otherworld researching, King Kai and Goku were able to find out what they needed. A ritual. 
In the afterlife, Goku was able to find five pure-hearted Saiyans. Some actually from the past that helped the original Super Saiyan God. The ritual was done on him, and Goku shows off that he's also a Super Saiyan God. Wow, everyone was a bit concerned about where Goku would be in terms of power, but this is going to be very helpful. Not to mention, Goku's been training 24-7. He doesn't need to sleep in other world. So for all those years, he's just been training. And thankfully, since he still is dead, energy's not even an issue. Not that it would be with Super Saiyan God. He still hasn't figured out how to access Super Saiyan Blue yet. He only got Super Saiyan God fairly recently, but he did find something else that kind of worked. He doesn't know how effective this would be if he were alive, but he tries it out here. He's able to stack Kyo Ken on top of Super Saiyan God. Unfortunately, he's still not on Vegeta's level. But who knows, maybe this tournament will push his limits, let him get Super Saiyan Blue even. And as far as he knows, the humans might even be around their level too, especially Ten Shinhan. He's definitely interested to see how everyone's grown so far, but also, he's glad that he's going to be able to fight here too. And now with all the team together, the Tournament of Power could finally begin. As I mentioned, Universe 7 isn't the enemy here. Other universes aren't blaming them for starting this tournament, so right away they're not being attacked by everyone. Not that it really matters though, they go out and find their own people to fight. The team is actually pretty strong here. I mean, when you think about it, it's almost the exact same. Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan are a bit weaker than normal, but as for everyone else, they're stronger than normal. Of course, Chaozu is replacing Frieza here. But the rest of the team is the same as it is in the main story, and they're stronger than before, outside of the three Saiyans. Not to say that the Saiyans are weak either, they're still very strong in their own right, just a little bit behind where they were normally, specifically Goku and Gohan. And at first, Universe 7 isn't really having much trouble, they're a lot more powerful than other universes. Slowly but surely, fighters are getting eliminated, and eventually the first few universes actually get eliminated too. And there is a pretty big issue here, Jiren. Goku would probably be pretty stoked to fight him, but even Goku can tell. At his current level, he might not be enough. At some point, he probably would try and spar with Jiren, but it wouldn't really go anywhere. Not even leading to a spear bomb or anything. He would be stopped fairly quickly. And this is what really gets everyone concerned. This guy's suppressed right now, and he was able to defeat Goku that quickly. They'll worry about him later on. Right now, the team thinks the best strategy is just to ignore him. He is just sitting there waiting too. Maybe if they could weed out the rest of the fighters, eventually they could just get to him, and all gang up on him together. So for now, they are just going to ignore him, focusing on the other universes instead. But the fight is getting tougher. Eventually, the Saiyans have to go into their higher forms. Thankfully, a lot of Universe 7 is at a great advantage. Since a lot of the team is comprised of androids, no one's running out of energy. Some other fighters in the tournament are getting a bit tired by now, but these guys are at their full power still. And as everyone else shows off their higher forms, Ten thinks it's time to show off his. Now, I wasn't really too sure what to do with this. A lot of people were asking me to give him an original form, an awakened state of sorts. This transformation will be unique to him, based on him being a Triclops. When he transforms, it gives him a greenish-bluish aura. His third eye glows, the pupils in his regular eye change as well. And most noticeably, his four witches technique activates, being there the entire time he's in this transformation. Which was just referred to as the Awakened Triclops form, it's based on all his godly training, and it's very martial arts based. It buffs his power significantly, releasing all of his potential at once, enhancing his speed, strength, defenses, and reflexes. From all of his great training and his martial arts experience in general, combined with the heightened power and reflexes of this form, and the fact that he's got four arms while in it, and not to mention the fact that he has three eyes and great eyesight, he's able to read the enemy's moves really easily. It's mainly with his third eye, it basically helps him see what's happening before it happens, choreographing moves out in front of him. It's not like Ultra Instinct where he's going to be moving on his own. He still has to consciously do the movement, at least somewhat consciously. But instead, it's like he's analyzing everyone's fighting style, being able to predict and choreograph moves. The third eye is not just seeing what's physically there, it's seeing much more than that. Everyone's amazed to see this brand new power. And not to mention, this awakened form is being used by an android. The infinite energy is really going to help him out, because he's working at 100% power all the time, and he's never going to tire out. The battles continue getting fiercer and fiercer. Slowly but surely, Universe 7 is actually being pushed back. Thankfully, they haven't had any fighters eliminated yet. Right now, the weakest on the team is Chaozu, and even he's pretty strong in his own right. He is an android after all, and has been training a lot more than usual. So if that's the person on the team with the lowest amount of strength, you can imagine how strong the rest of the team is. More and more universes begin to be eliminated. The androids all begin teaming up with each other. 17 and 18 stick together, also working a lot with Krillin. This is a very powerful combination, with all three of them together in their combined strength, plus the mind of Krillin on that team, they're actually able to eliminate a lot of fighters from Universe 4. Goku ends up facing some from Universe 6. Vegeta's about to face Hit, but he actually goes up to face Ten Shinhan. This will actually be a great test for Ten's powers. A guy that can mess with time. Think about it. Hit's always ahead, making movements a fraction of a second before Ten can even react. But Ten's able to choreograph everything. Even if Hit is manipulating time, Ten can pick up a bunch of precise movements within his work. His new awakened Triclops state is actually a great match for Hit. Piccolo and Gohan take on some other pride troopers. Yamcha and Chaozu work alongside Goku. As this is all going on, more and more fighters are eliminated from other universes, meaning more universes are eliminated as well. 
but this also concerns a lot of Universe 7. Some of the fighters left are from Universe 11. They've been able to eliminate all the Pride Troopers by now, except for three, Topo, Dispo, and Jiren. Jiren's definitely going to be a big issue later on, and like they said before, they're going to worry about him last. He's not a threat now, so they don't need to focus on him, but these other two are pretty strong. Ten's actually able to defeat Hit, and Dispo decides to go in and fight him instead. If he's able to take out someone like Hit, he might be an issue for everyone else, but Dispo feels that his speed will be more than enough to take on Ten Shinho. And it actually really isn't. Once again, Ten's able to analyze his precise movements, figuring out what Dispo's going to do before he even does it, even when he's in his light speed mode. Ten's eyes can still keep track of him. Even when Dispo tries attacking from behind, that doesn't work. It's almost like Ten has eyes on the back of his head. And there's also the fact that he actually does have arms behind him. Dispo's movements are very quick, but they're also pretty simple and easy to predict. As Ten faces him, Topo goes up against some of Universe 7, facing Goku and Vegeta together. The two of them are using their max power right now. Goku is in God Kaioken, while Vegeta is in Blue. Together, the two are actually having a tough time facing Topo. Gohan and Piccolo join in, trying to help buy some time for these two. Damn, Goku expected better of his training. He's been spending all this time in Otherworld, but he commends Vegeta, even without the advantages of being dead, he's been able to get so strong. Goku wants to reach that level. Ever since he first saw Super Saiyan Blue and heard about it, he's wanted to get it for himself. But he's confident, he could pull this off. Even if it's taken a while, this might be it. This will be the opportunity for him to break his limits. After all, it is just Super Saiyan with Super Saiyan God. He could pull it off. He starts powering up. A bluish aura surrounds him. The rest watch on with amazement. And Vegeta smirks. He's actually doing it. Goku shouts, his hair spikes up, and then turns a bluish color. His aura explodes, and now, he's fully transformed into Super Saiyan Blue. It's weird getting the hang of it. Thankfully, since he's dead, energy's not an issue for him right now. If he were alive, well, he'd barely be able to use this form. But maybe, just maybe, he can keep control of it and actually use it in this fight. And hey, soon enough he could probably even combine it with Kaioken, but that's a little far off for now. Right now, the four of them are just focused on Topo. Together, they're actually all able to push him back. He's not going to be pushed into his God of Destruction mode here. He has no reason to abandon his morals and actually go into that. The four of them are all working together. In his eyes, that's justice. Four people all helping each other to save their universe. Even if they are his opponents, it is noble. It's tough, but the four are able to defeat him, knocking him out of the ring. The rest of the fighters are cleaned up. Ten finishes his fight with Dispo, thanks to some help from the other androids. And then they realize something weird. They look around in the ring, and in the stands. There's no one left. Everyone's been defeated. Well, except for one universe. Universe 11 is still there in the stands, and of course, they still have one fighter left. It's Jiren. He's been meditating this entire time, but then he opens his eyes. Impressive. They even defeated the Pride Troopers, but this is the end of the line for them. There's no way they're going to be able to defeat him. Jiren powers up just a bit, and it's enough to terrify everyone. Goku and Vegeta are amazed. This power, it's unlike anything they've ever sensed before. Even when Goku fought him before, he didn't feel anything like this. Ten powers up once more, but even when he tries to analyze Jiren, he figures out something terrifying. This isn't the full extent of his power. This is just a small fraction of it. Everyone's unsure, but they're not going to give up here. Jiren begins his assault. Immediately, he's able to take out some of the androids, as well as some other fighters. Piccolo, Chaozu, and Krillin are the first to go, unexpectedly attacked by him first. He then stretches his hand out, charging a quick blast. Gohan and 18 are the next to go. The rest of their fighters all start their attack. Yamcha creates a spirit ball, then another, then another. He keeps creating an array of them, throwing them all at Jiren, but Jiren's able to effortlessly dodge all of them. He widens his eyes, and just from that shockwave, all the spirit balls freeze, and they're launched right back at Yamcha, knocking him out of the ring. Jiren slowly works his way throughout. Ten's trying to think of a plan, but then something catches his eye, well, his third eye. He tries to analyze Zeno, what he's thinking. He doesn't know why, but he feels like this is the end of the line, and for some reason he focuses on that. Thanks to his third eye and from what he learned from the Kais, he does have limited abilities of this. Zeno's too preoccupied with the fight to even notice this going on, but then something clicks. This whole tournament, Zeno's giving everyone one last shot. He joins the fight with Jiren and begins talking. He asks Jiren what he's going to wish for, and Jiren does have a selfish wish. But Ten pleads with him, reconsider it. He knows that Jiren's probably going to win here. Of course, he's not giving up. He's still going to keep fighting. But think about what he could do with the Super Dragon Balls. He could bring everyone back. He is a Pride Trooper after all, right? From what Ten learned before from the other Pride Troopers, they fight for justice. He should be doing the same. But Jiren says he has no need to revive the other universes. If he wins, it's his right to make whatever wish he wants. But Goku and Vegeta realize this too. Maybe this is a test from Zeno. And Ten says that's exactly it. Think about it. It makes perfect sense. Mortals should be looking out for each other. Show that they're good, worth saving. Even though Jiren's cold on the surface, Ten can tell he still is heroic. He needs to do this, not just for them, but for the entire multiverse. Set a good example, be a hero. The rest of the fighters continue to get eliminated. Ten's thrown out of the ring, then Vegeta. And finally, Goku is knocked out. As expected, Jiren ends up being the victor. 
and they all watch as Universe 7 is erased. The team shoots one last glare at Jiren, hoping they get the message across, do the right thing. And now, Jiren has a choice. As the last remaining fighter and the MVP, he gets the wish from the Super Dragon Balls. But what'll he wish for? Will he actually wish to revive his master? He's about to make the wish, but he hesitates. He's thrown aside others all his life. He's never placed his trust in anyone else. But that display from Universe 7, it was something different. To the end, even though they knew they were going to lose, they all stuck together, placing their trust in each other. Hell, they even placed trust within Jiren. On one hand, he might consider it kind of foolish, but also he thinks back to what they said. He is a pride trooper after all. He has to save others. And with this great power in front of him, is that all he's going to wish for, just to revive his master who's been dead for so many years? Or will he wish for something much greater, the right wish? And he looks right at Zeno. Despite Zeno looking childish, he's definitely a lot smarter than he puts on. And Jiren realizes what he must do. He looks at the dragon, wishing for all the universes to be restored. The wish is granted. Back in Universe 7, everyone reappears. What, what happened? They were erased, they're sure of it. But they know what happened. Jiren listened to what they were saying. He saw the light. They placed trust in him. And it worked. He wished for them to come back. Even though they lost, it was a great experience. They had a fun time. And who cares about the Super Dragon Balls? They didn't really need them anyways. As long as the multiverse is safe, that's really all that matters. And even better, they do get a nice present at the end. Lord Beerus was pretty impressed with Goku's display in the tournament, him being a Super Saiyan god and all, even getting Super Saiyan in blue. Not to mention, because he did join the team, he thinks Goku does deserve some sort of gift. Whis taps Goku with his staff, and his halo disappears. After all this time, Goku's brought back to life. This is amazing. No one really knows what to think about it. I mean, it's kind of awkward having him back after all this time, but they'll get used to it. They're elated to have Goku back. And this time it's not temporary, it's for good. Technically, yeah, they did lose the tournament. But collectively, Universe 7 did win in a way, as well as the entire multiverse, and they did get a victory over Jiren. Not a physical one, but a mental one. Those people from Universe 7, they do interest him. They left quite the impression, and this is where we'll leave off. So, what did you guys think about this part? And what did you think about the series as a whole? I'm going to be ending it off here. Honestly, it doesn't seem like there's too much interest for it to continue, but luckily we were close to the end anyways, so I felt it deserved the ending. Leave all your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like, and let's try hit that like over from the beginning of the video, because it lets me know you want to see more videos like this one. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? as well as hitting the bell icon so you're notified about any future uploads on my channel, including more like this one. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in my next video.